Good afternoon uh, and welcome to the second in a series of Inerva interviews uh, where I'm interviewing interesting and uh, um, um, uh, sort of industry people about uh, their businesses and um, the sectors that they work in. Um, today I've got Warren Smythe with me who's the Chief Executive of uh, Abbey Croft, Croft Leisure and, uh, and we're going to talk about his business um, and sort of some of the challenges that he's facing uh, and some of the things particularly around the, the pivot to uh, health and well-being uh, and how Abbey, Abbey Croft has sort of made that shift. So um, yeah Warren if you'd like to introduce yourself and, and, and tell us a bit about yourself and Abbey Croft and what you do. As you mentioned, John, it's good to be here, first of all. Uh, um, second is, well, I'm Warren from Abercroft Leisure. I, I, I'm fortunate enough to be CEO. Uh, I'm quite lucky to be involved in an organisation that's got a breadth of activity, really, and I suppose we're best known and we're predominantly a physio facility operator. hate that term. I absolutely detest it, but actually that's what we're known as at the moment. We need to change that. We run 13 facilities in 10 communities, predominantly in the west of Suffolk. It's about half the county, actually, generally. Um, more recently, we've recruited a health and wellbeing team, particularly coming out of COVID, and we're currently commissioned to deliver some pathway work for them across a broad range of conditions, but we can talk about that in a bit. Um, we've also got an active community team. Their job is to go out into the community, deliver a wide range of initiatives, but also maximise the use of the assets we have in the community to get people active. Uh, um, and we do have an outdoor pursuits uh, um, team, but it's a mobile one, fascinating. They're not based anywhere. Uh, um, and they use public open space in a number of locations to deliver everything from forest schools to, interestingly, uh, food poverty programs, educating people how to cook in the outdoors, mental health programs. So a real broad brush of stuff. So, yeah, lucky, lucky, actually, person to be involved in things like that. So, so it's quite interesting you say the facility operator piece, because because actually sort of in my experience uh, of you know, working with you and talking to you, you know, actually, I, I think you're best known for the, the health and well-being community based kind of stuff that you do. So it is interesting that you mentioned, you know, that that sort of facility piece, because it does give you a good base, doesn't it? And and really interesting, actually, that you mentioned about the um, the sort of the, the the outdoors team, as it were, because, uh, you know, I think certainly within leisure, you know, moving outside of those four walls is really important, isn't it? Yeah, I think it is. And I think the way we try and look at it uh, in a really simple form is we have some infrastructure and the knowledge and some skills across those services, really, that you try and adapt to help deal with challenges. Um, and when you're talking about the pivot to well-being, I think that's sort of something we've got to bear in our mind. We have a lot of tools at our disposal, but we're not the experts in everything. So it's quite fascinating about, you know, how we describe ourselves is a challenge, interestingly. Um, and, it, and it's something we've had with our local authority partners and stakeholders about what are we and how do we describe ourselves. They, they actually describe us as strategic partners of theirs. So it, it, it's interesting. I sort of I sort of reverted to the facility operator term because I think it's the easiest way of explaining to colleagues what we do, actually, because they understand that. So, so you mentioned there, obviously, you know, you work in the local authority leisure sector. Um, yeah, there are clearly, uh, as people are watching this will know, there are challenges facing that sector over the next 12 months. So so specifically for Abbeycroft, you know, what are those challenges and how are you facing up to them? Yeah, I suppose um, yeah, it's well documented and I won't spend too long on it because um, I think uh, um, people are speaking about it constantly. Obviously, util utilities challenges are is a challenge in its own right. The costs of that, that's facing a number of sectors, as, but predominantly hitting swimming pools. Um, we're working with our stakeholders, and I mean our broadest stakeholders, to work with, you know, how do we solve that problem? And we've got positive conversations ongoing, so that's really good news. Uh, um, I think the other part is that there's sort of a talking point in our sector is staff recruitment and retention. And I think that's important in general in terms of what it serves, you, you know, traditionally staffing our buildings, but also about how we attract and retain high quality staff that will assist us with that pivot to health and wellbeing and gain us credibility, actually. And, and, and we have a role to play in that in terms of working with not only our Chartered Institute, but local stakeholders. How can we bring the best of both worlds together and work in partnership? And I can see in the future things like how do we share staff amongst stakeholders? How do we create roles that are across the system? Uh, um, and we've been we're involved in a couple of light touch conversations around this because we're not the only sector that's got the staff retention recruitment issue. You know, the health system has that issue in itself. You know, so how do you make a role a little bit more attractive, enjoyable, 
perhaps has a different development path, not just within leisure, but in the system as a whole and vice versa. So, yeah, I think, you know, in one sense, that's, that's a real challenge, but a real opportunity at the same time, because we've all got similar issues, um, if you see what I mean. Um, yeah. I think the other thing is, from a public sector point of view, is how do we really differentiate our offer from, you know, and I particularly reference health and fitness there, you know, how do we really identify our target market and our target audience, given, you know, the type of market that is now evolving in most probably every, you know, town, town up and down the country. And, and I think we have to be a little bit more uh, targeted around what we are trying to do and the sort of audiences we're trying to attract. Uh, um, and that will be slightly different in each location. But uh, um, but generally, I think the public sector needs to be able to position itself and be really clear about its market, what it's trying to do. Uh, um, and alongside that, really, is how do we position ourselves with stakeholders to help them deal with their challenges? So it's a bit like the health system, the pivot to health, but I could say it's local authorities, it's youth system, social care, all those things, actually. How do we work with them to to deal with their issues in a really effective and efficient way and be more than just actually it comes back to my term facility operator you know within the four walls you know how do we use the four walls to solve other problems i think so it's I think really interesting it's really interesting you were sort of saying then about you know what it is that you do and, and specific reference to say health and fitness because certainly my my experience of the sector is far too often um uh, yeah, people or, or, or organisations within the sector are trying to just do what others do better and, and, and actually structurally they probably can't and, and actually there is a really interesting point that you made there about you know defining what it is that you do and how you do it and, and then that differentiation piece so I think that's a uh, that's really interesting and, and, and for me quite an enlightening uh, what you've just kind of said because you know if you're going to try and compete with a budget club you simply aren't going to do that those guys are set up to do that whereas structurally many organizations are simply never going to compete so differentiation and being good at what you actually can do and bringing that sort of unique point I think is really strong yeah and I think there's a there's a bit of an honesty that needs to emerge out of that you see actually what are we good at yeah and what do we provide against what aren't we good at and what can't we provide yeah and just um, really having an honest conversation with ourselves about what that is uh, um I, I think there's also there's also probably a point in there about having those conversations with your partners, though. I mean, you described yourself as being a strategic partner. And, and I guess in that you'll have those be able to have those kind of conversations with your authority, local authority partners and, and other stakeholders, you know, about what it is that you do do and what you can do and, and sort of trying to manage their expectations as well, is it? Yeah, I think so, because I think one of the challenges around the public sector leisure is in general, it was set up to be appealed to everyone. Hmm. Yeah. All right, well, 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 as you mostly well know, given your background, John, that brings different challenges, doesn't it? So you're tasked yeah. with doing something for everyone, but when other parts of the system, for one of a term, are already doing things for some for certain aspects, then should you replicate that or should you differentiate that? You know, my view is we're moving to a place where we've got to differentiate that and complement and collaborate rather than compete. That that's my view because actually I don't think. Um, I don't like using the term winning and losing, but but we won't be here actually in the future unless no. we change approach. It's quite dangerous to change approach because you're unraveling everything you sort of already know, uh, um, and 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 there's risks associated with that, you know. And even the pivot to wellbeing, there are risks associated with that. Uh, um, and I'm not saying health and fitness isn't really important. It's still a really important aspect of what we do, particularly from a financial point of view. But, it, you know, it needs to be different is where I'm heading with it. And there are yeah. risks to changing. Yeah. Well, so 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 it, it kind of segues really nicely into sort of my next question, which really is around that pivot uh, to health and well-being and, and how particularly you guys have made that adjustment. Now, as I sort of referenced before, I, I think Abbeycroft um, uh, are doing some really, really interesting things. I know a, a bit a bit about your business and about what you kind of do. And 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 for me, you know, there's certainly some I hate this term thought leadership that you're applying in relation to that field. And 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 so yeah, it'd be great for 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 the for the uh, for the watchers, as it were, to sort of try and find out a little bit more about um, what you think about that sector pivot and and specifically what what you guys have done and that's the successes and the challenges. Yeah, I suppose I'd start by saying clearly we're an advocate. Uh, um, in terms of, you know, we're moving along a bit of a path now that I suggest, or has been suggested that the system's terms of pivot to health and well-being. Now, whether that's right or wrong, we shall have to see, because I think it's a bit broader than that, actually. So if you pick up things like uh, antisocial behaviour and how we impact on those things, that's part of a more system 
sort of approach really so i think that we need to be careful not to pigeonhole ourselves so i think i'm an advocate of it absolutely but be careful with some of the terminology we lose uh, um, i think picking up on your we do I, I, my way i term this is we've done some stuff <laughs> actually and actually at first there wasn't much strategy behind it so particularly pre-covid actually um uh, we've done some good things i suggest and a lot of ledger trusts and operators do good things um in small pockets uh, um, and some of those built into slightly bigger <laughs> initiatives but nothing too great but covid actually created a bit of a platform for us that particularly when our assist when our sites and facilities were closed and our services were closed how did we one help the system with the challenges they had you know how do we help with vaccinations how did we help with medical supplies how did we use our workforce to assist them and we did a bit of that within reason the other thing that emerged is certainly was we emerging out of lockdown we all those pockets that i've just been speaking about whether it's falls prevention exercise and referral whatever it is there was uh, um, there was a discussion with the health system particularly so well you're going to bring those back aren't you and actually we said well no we can't because they were all funded by us and the challenges COVID has brought us mean that we can't continue, uh, you know, cross-subsidising that effectively at the moment. Um, so they sort of just worked with us to bring it back, really, provided a bit of pump priming and so on and so forth. Uh, um, so, yeah, COVID sort of turned a corner for us quite dramatically. The only bit I would say is we had made a decision quite early on that we wanted to be an integrated part of the system. So we had lined ourselves up. So this is where there was a bit of strategy behind it, actually, is actually which conversations do we need to have and with who and which meetings do we need to be in to you know play our role as such so so we did quite a lot of that to begin with uh, um, and since that point actually we're getting quite a lot of traction we deliver two pathways for our foundation trusts one of those is around frailty uh, um, and one of those is around pulmonary rehabilitation um, we do some work around some cancer rehab we're doing some work in mental health uh, um, we're actually just launching or just have launched we're doing some activity in care homes which are really suffering with staff churn so the the, the issue you know in, in care homes i think a lot of operators used to do a lot of work and that stops because they were educating their own providers as such now they've lost that knowledge so we're reintroducing that a little bit so we're doing that uh, um, and then uh, um, we're also just we're literally just about to launch a pilot taking a portion of patients uh, um, off the waiting list actually for elective care or elective surgery sorry uh, um, and, uh, um, and how can we either work with them to make sure they're well enough to undertake their operation when they get it or actually not need it at all so that, that you, you know there's some interesting work emerging out of that work and it, it just seems to keep growing and growing and more recently we've secured a bit of public health funding to uh, carry out health checks in our facilities uh, um, and actually that's been quite popular because we're a different setting uh, um, that, you know people you know don't mind going to their doctor their GP surgery or their pharmacy or wherever it might be but actually community health checks is a really interesting area and I think some of the feedback we've had is people are coming to us for the health check with us because they're in a place they could do something about it yeah there's a fascinating dynamic around that yeah. immediately I I might be able to do something about it yeah uh, um, so yeah it's it's really starting to mothball I suppose and public health have provided some funding for um for also for uh, uh, a young person's mental health program we run with Suffolk Mind uh, um, and a program we call Active Mums which is about um preventing weight gain during pregnancy really well or probably okay. healthy weight gain let's put it that way yeah so, so so it's really interesting you sort of you know what you're describing there um is that you've clearly got the trust of those partners now in, in terms of what you're providing so you know clearly you're providing results clearly you're providing it in a consistent and uh, positive kind of manner but what would you say the key was in those initial conversations to uh, you know to allow them to take that jump to kind of work with you i think the first thing is you've got to have done something first to put you in that position so you've got to show some um willing Okay. to help them with something yeah uh, um, and i um and, and you know internally we've had some challenges around that in the past you know and and this is the i'm going to use a really crude example you know nhs physio comes into the leisure center with like a entire bit of studio space gm turns turns around and says yeah that's 40 quid an hour yeah yeah 
NHS physio walks out the door and then tells everyone else. That that's really yeah. No, that's as crude as it gets, really. Yeah. So there's a bit of a willingness to have a chat about that. I think the other bit is having a really honest conversation when you are talking to senior people about your ability to do things. You know, we we've had some really honest conversations with senior systems leaders around what we're good at and what we're not good at. You know, we're quite good. We've got some facilities. We've got some great staff that interact with the community really, really well. We've got good knowledge of our communities generally because. You know, facilities are generally placed in some great spaces um, and we've got a level of enthusiasm and are willing to learn. What we're not good at, I don't think, and this is us, we're not good at clinical governance. We don't understand that. We don't. We have a level of knowledge, but not the level of knowledge you guys have, really. But what we're willing to do is how do we work with you and complement what you do and create a true collaborative partnership? So I think portraying elements of weakness to them interestingly meant that yeah. well these guys sort of aren't the finished article they're not saying that actually they're not yeah. arrogant with their approach or anything they just want a conversation and and we don't talk about money that's the interesting thing to begin with we say well actually what's the problem how yeah. can we work with you to find a solution and then okay how do we resource this effectively i i think is a there is a cost to this. I'm not disputing that, actually. But as how do you work together with the resources available to make that happen? That's and, 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 and I'm guessing, you know, everything you've described there is about building that relationship, isn't it? And building that trust, you know, and I think it's interesting you make the point about being honest, you know, which in essence is, you know, not trying to pretend that you can do everything because actually I think there's some inherent distrust if somebody comes along and, and provides that completed answer, as it were, whereas, you know, what you've described is a very human interaction that builds that that longer term relationship. Yeah. And, and the other thing I wouldn't underplay, actually, is the role our local authority partners have. I mean, we have two local authority partners, West Suffolk Council and Baby District Council, and both of them are advocates for us in this space. So they understand what we can do, how we can work, how we work together. And actually both sets of councils have made investments in their facilities to enable this to happen. So there is a a, a, um, a need for your facilities maybe to be designed to welcome that opportunity as well. Now, whether that's lots of multifunctional space, whether that's, you know, I will name drop Minerva. And, um, you know, we've got an Minerva studio and, and, and how that works. And that's been welcomed by particularly health practitioners as well. We've got other facilities, actually, and other equipment that, that complements what we're doing, that serves our broader audience, but also can cater for those with certain conditions and just be open minded around that. And I think if we split out a bit of a, a strategy that's emerging for us is we work in three different tiers. One is in the acute. How do we work with prehabilitation, rehabilitation? If you see what I mean, working with that acute system, working in prevention. How do we work with the public health teams to deal with, you know, some of the issues that they're facing? And the other bit is a real basic one. How do we actually offer space and infrastructure for health partners to deliver their own activity? And in a couple of places, we are a, a landlord actually to the health system or contractors in the health system. So. Yeah, it's you know it's about actually having a broader approach, and I think one of the things about the pivot to wellbeing at the moment, it feels like there's a quite a big push on the prevention agenda, and I think it's going to have to be far broader than that. And and there are immediate challenges for the health system now that we need to be able to try and help them with, because I think that's the pressure point at the moment for them. And if you've got someone knocking on your door saying I'm willing to try and help you, yeah. I would hope they'd welcome you in. Yeah. Warren, we're, uh, we're we're nearly out of time. Um, I, yeah. I could literally sit here and 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 speak to you kind of, you know, for for the rest of the day. Uh, and there may be people who are interested in sort of talking to you. So I, I'm guessing they can look you up, at, you know, on LinkedIn. And, and yep. I'm sure you'd be happy to sort of continue the conversation sort of offline. Yeah, more than happy to do so. Yeah, brilliant. Absolutely. Thanks, John. No. No, well, thanks very much for your time. And um, yeah, hopefully you've enjoyed this, everybody. And uh, um, yeah, well, there'll be further in other interviews to come. And th thanks very much, Warren.